Before we head into the show, I want to personally invite you to partner with the Graceology podcast through our Patreon program. When you join our Patreon community, you'll get all kinds of bonuses like exclusive content, early access, and private hangouts with me. (laughs) Patreon support helps the Graceology podcast team keep bringing you these fun, faith-focused, grace-filled conversations. So if you like the podcast, please visit gwensmith.net slash give and sign up as a member of our Patreon Graceology community. Once again, that's gwensmith.net slash give. Now let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Graceology with Gwen Smith podcast. I'm Gwen Smith, and I'm so glad you've joined me today. Around here, we have fun, faith-focused, grace-filled conversations, all to help you know and trust God more. Our discussions are honest, often humorous, and always practical, and they're going to encourage you in meaningful ways to live out and lean on the grace of Jesus in the midst of cluttered, messy days. You got any of those? I know I do, and I can't wait to get to today's show, which is part four of our Summer Rewind series. We wrapped up season three of the Graceology podcast in late June, and before we move forward with season four, we're taking a pause to look back. In our first two years of the show, we've had so many incredible guests and tons of powerful conversations. The Summer Rewind series is an opportunity for us to celebrate some of the ways the Lord has used His people to encourage and challenge us toward His hope and His heart. Today's Summer Rewind features excerpts from conversations with Holly Girth and John Eldridge. Holly opens up about her lifelong battle with anxiety and depression, and she shares some practical, transformative lessons that God's been teaching her about how to lean into your strengths and find the unique gifts you have to offer. Then John Eldridge and I have a great conversation about the exhausting pace of life and how you can get your life back. He shares some personal and powerful insights that are going to help move your weary, overwhelmed soul toward the healing it's desperate for. Hey guys, I just want to say a quick thank you to all of you in the Graceology community who have rated the show on iTunes or who have written a short review. It makes such a big difference. So if you happen to be listening and you've not yet done it, I would really appreciate it if you would. Would you click your podcast app or go visit iTunes and give us a five-star rating or just a quick one-sentence review? From my heart, it would really mean a lot. In third grade, I started having all these stomach aches that couldn't be explained. And I would go to the nurse's office a lot Mm. and all these medical tests were done and they couldn't figure out anything physically wrong with me. And the doctor finally just shrugged his shoulders and said, stress, you know, and looking back now, I know it was the start of my anxiety and it feels like I was hardwired that way because there wasn't anything, you know, really hard going on in my life at that time. It wasn't trauma. It was just kind of seemed to be wired into me. And so that looked like anxiety through my teen years and a lot of social anxiety, getting nervous around people Mm -hmm. and then into my early adulthood combined with some periods of depression. And so in my early 20s, after I got married, I decided to go see a counselor and she gave me a little evaluation, uh, just a quick test to see if I had depression and anxiety. And I did. And so it was a relief actually to have a name for it, Mm. you know, to be like, okay, I'm not the only one who's Mm. ever dealt with this. And also this isn't normal, you know, like it's okay, but it's not normal, which means I can get better Mm. because when you live that way for a long time, you just think this is just the way it is. This is the way I am. There's not much I can do about it, you know? And so that was actually kind of a relief. And so I went on to get a master's degree in counseling, which was really helpful for me because I learned a lot about, you know, myself in that progress. And I learned more about depression and anxiety and what could help and what might be causing that. So after that, I 
you know, continued counseling. I also worked with my doctor. I take medication. I'm not ashamed of that either because I do believe it is physical. And I also just studied a lot about, you know, how our brains are wired. And some of us just have more sensitive nervous systems than others. And that means that we get anxious a lot more easily and anxiety is tied to depression. And so I realized that the other end of my anxiety was my superpowers. Mm. You know, for a long time, I prayed, God, take this away from me. I was like, Paul, you know, like, take this away from me. And he never said yes. And so I finally said, well, if you're not going to take it away, then what do you want to do with it? And he showed me through a lot of different ways that, you know, the opposite of anxiety is empathy. People who are anxious are deeply engaged in life. They care about people. They notice things. They're tuned into emotion. You know, they're observing what's around them all the time. So I have this empathy that makes me a great friend and a great wife and, you know, a good writer because Mm -hmm. I notice things about life. And so I began to look at it not as I need to get rid of this, but seeing it as a continuum where on one end was anxiety. And on the other end was empathy and creativity and all these strengths. And so I thought, I'm just going to learn how to go to the strengths end of this. Like, I just want to know how to live more on the strength side. Yes. And so that's really what I've been working on. And there are still days, you know, when anxiety comes up. But I feel like I now know how to get myself to the other end yeah. of that. Sometimes I need help from other people or go see my counselor again or take a long nap or whatever it is. But I do feel feel like I know how to lean into those strengths more than I ever have. Okay, so let's I love being practical. So you just mentioned a few things that helped you as you studied and went to get your master's in counseling, some things that have helped you move forward through the anxiety and depression or address them as they sometimes resurface. So you said take a nap, go see your counselor. What are some other practical things that have helped you that you think if a listener is is also struggling with anxiety or depression or both or even dwelling in the shame of it and feeling uncomfortable with even talking about it. How did you get there to a place that is better, that is more in tune with your superpower? Yeah. The blessings of it. Yeah. Well, I would say if a woman's listening for her to draw a circle on a piece of paper and then divide it into four sections, because I think it's about looking at all the different parts of our lives. You know, we can think the solution's totally spiritual and forget our bodies and our hearts and our minds. But I think that God has given us solutions in all those areas. So it's important to look at all of them. So I think first we look at this, the physical, you know, go see your doctor and say, Hey, I'm, I'm really struggling with anxiety or I'm experiencing depression, what could be going on? Because those can be caused by, yes, some brain imbalances, but also thyroid problems or not enough vitamin D or something like that, Mm -hmm. you know? And so it's important to just find out maybe this is just totally physical. So start there and then notice how tired you are. You know, exhaustion definitely contributes to anxiety and depression. So if you're not getting enough sleep, commit to that, you know, set a bedtime alarm and not just a get up in the morning alarm so that you're getting eight hours of sleep. And then look at what you're eating. You know, I'm, I'm not a hardcore any kind of diet person, but I know when I eat a lot of sugar, then I feel worse. And when I drink too much caffeine, my anxiety is worse. So it's just knowing for my body, what impacts me. So evaluate your body. And then I think, you know, relationships would be the next part of that little chart that we're drawing and saying, do I have the support I need in my life right now? And for me, that looked like having a counselor. I love counseling. I'm trained as one. I will go back as often as I need to. It meant also having a supportive group of friends. And I know that's hard for people in different seasons of life. They may have had a move or be working 60 hours a week or, you know, have a little baby. And so I would say even if you have one person in your life that you can just confide in on those hard days, you know, that's important. And if that person isn't there, sometimes it means you start out by being that person to someone else. I've been in seasons like that. So it is okay if you don't have that support system now 
now, just know you at least need one person in your life that you can tell when you're struggling. So relationally checking in Mm -hmm. and then, you know, mentally just understanding the brain wiring behind it because they have brain scans now that literally show parts of the brain light up when you're in depression. It's not just something you're making up. Mm -hmm. And so I would recommend, you know, doing some research, even just Googling like brain science behind depression, brain science behind anxiety and just figuring out how your brain works because that can help you find solutions. And then spiritually, of course, is the most important of all. And I think in that area, like you said, it's really about getting over the shame and guilt, you know, all the way back to Eden. When we do something or are struggling with something that we think God is not going to like very much, we tend to hide. Yeah. And so, you know, so if we have anxiety and depression, I think the first thing we need to know is it's okay to come out of hiding. That God is not surprised by this. He's not shocked or dismayed by it. There's literally a verse in Psalms where it says, I was in deep depression. I mean, this is part of the human condition, especially for some of us with certain nervous systems and brain wiring. And so just being honest with God and starting where you are, I think if someone is listening and has been telling themselves, when I get it all together, (laughs) then I'll take this to God. That is You don't have to do that. Just come as you are and say, this is where I am right now. Even if that's, I can hardly get out of bed in the morning. That is okay. And then, you know, making sure you're spending time with him and in his word, even if that means you only have the energy to read one verse a day and pray for five minutes, just start where you are and with what you can do. And then check in on all those areas regularly. You know, when you start slipping back into it, I kind of run through that list in my mind, like, okay, what's off with me physically? What's off with my relationships? What's off, you know, with God? Where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. And then how can I get back to the place where I live that I don't struggle quite as much with this? Yeah. When you were talking about our tendency to hide from God when we're not happy about something about ourselves or maybe it's even some decisions that we're making, it reminds me of one of my favorite verses, one of my life verses is Psalm 34, 5, which is those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. It does not say those who have a perfect life, those whose emotions are intact, those who make all the best decisions. It says those who look to him are radiant and we're, we're radiant because because of on whom we gaze, not because of the choices we make. It's, it's because of his grace. And I love that. It allows my soul to take a breath of hope and just to feel his presence and his peace, to remember that there is no shame in his presence when we, yeah. when we know Jesus. And so I love that. That is, that is super helpful. I love even the, I mean, it's like you're drawing a wagon wheel and then you're like, circle the wagons, baby. If you're slipping, <laughs> uh, get back and visit, visit it and check in right Regularly. That's terrific. I love it. I love it. I love it. One of the things that I, I really appreciate about your story that you tell so openly is you say that you grew up and you naturally are an introvert and that that used to be a struggle. And now you've learned to kind of flip that to the side of strength. And, and you even call it that superpower. So talk about being an introvert. What has God taught you through that? Well, that's another thing that I didn't realize for a long time, that I was an introvert, and there are a whole lot of us. The latest numbers put us at about 50% of the population. So, <laughs> Which makes you sense. You know, if, if you're in a room, like one of every two people is feeling like you are. And I think most of us have learned to act like extroverts, even mm-hmm. if we're not. And so we think, oh, I'm the only one who's uncomfortable making small talk at this party, or who's tired and is ready to go home, or whatever it is. And so... In college, I was introduced to the Myers-Briggs personality yes. assessment. If someone doesn't know that, it's it just gives you four letters that describe how you're wired. And the first letter is I or E for introvert or extrovert. And it was just this huge light bulb, like... Oh my gosh, I still remember exactly where I was sitting cross-legged on this gray carpet in this old building. And it was just such a life-changing moment for me to realize, okay, that explains so much about who I am. And so 
I still wrestled with it a lot through my late 20s and early 30s, especially as I started to have a public role as a writer. Mm. I kept telling myself something is wrong with me. Like all the other women I see are outgoing and they can, you know, be comfortable in the spotlight and they like all the attention and it's hard for me. It's scary. You know, after I speak, I have to take a nap. (laughs) And so I got to the point almost of burnout, you know, and thought I I don't think I'm cut out for this. And God just kind of said, you know, if you walk away, I'll love you anyway. But if you want to keep doing this, then I will show you how to do it a different way. And that my book, Fierce Hearted, came out of that season. But that's when I started learning to make peace with who I was as an introvert. And since then, I've done a lot of research. And I think the biggest myth about introversion is that it's a preference. It's about your personality or how much you like or dislike people. So again, with the brain science, Introvert and extrovert brains rely on two different primary neurotransmitters. So the one for extroverts is the like get up and go, you know, neurotransmitter. And the introvert one that we tend to use is the calm down and rest. And also we have used different nervous systems, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So what introversion is about, it's not about people and how much we like or dislike them. It's how much stimulation we can handle before we're exhausted. Wow. So because introverts take in everything, like they can see it on, you know, scans now. And so our buckets just get full faster. It's not that we don't like people as much or that we want to be alone all the time. It's just that we hit our done point faster Yeah. in the way we recover is by being in solitude for a period and then we're ready to go back out again. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I am an ENFP, so I am off the charts. Yeah. (laughs) Playful and extroverted, but um... I love ENFPs. I'm an (laughs) INFJ. All the assessments say our types are compatible. Absolutely. (laughs) Exactly. We could work together and be like, okay, you go because I'm done. (laughs) I'd be like, okay. I love the question that you said you asked God when you were struggling with some of the anxiety and the depression and it was if you're not going to take it away then what do you want to do with it yeah I wanted to come back around to that because I think that's powerful I think that question if if we can begin to just like the psalmist I love when David wrote in Psalm 139 search me and know me Lord and and show me any ways that basically are not according to your will like rooted out in me if it's not of you but then also there's this different layer of what you're saying is, is Lord, if you're not going to take this away, if you're going to allow this struggle to remain in my life, or if you're going to keep me in this marriage, if you're going to allow my kid to rebel, if you're going to keep this person in the cubicle next to me at work, whatever that looks like, you know, if you're not going to take it away, then what do you want to do with it? Yes, absolutely. Mm. And I think, you know, we can't change our circumstances, but we can choose our response to them. Yeah. And that's not an easy thing. I mean, there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears probably in certain situations. But I think that helps us to feel empowered, you know, and not just I'm at the victim. You know, I'm a victim of whatever happens to me. Instead, we can say, okay, I can still choose. Even if it's really hard, even if I have some bad days, I can still choose today how I'm going to live. You can hear my conversation with Holly Girth in its entirety by finding episode number 40 on your podcast app, by clicking the link in the show notes, or by simply visiting gwensmith.net slash graceology. And now here's an excerpt from my conversation with John Eldridge from episode 86 that is going to help move your weary, overwhelmed soul toward the healing that we are all desperate for. I burned out about two years ago. And I wasn't, you know, having an affair and I didn't blow up the ministry and it didn't embezzle millions, but I was not well. Mm. My my soul just felt so shallow and dry. And I love I love life. I love God. I love people. I, I'm normally a very passionate person about whatever I'm doing. You know, whether it's family vacation or we're deep in the work of, of healing a human soul, but I'd lost that. And I knew it was 
it was the pace of life. Mm. It was the whole technology thing. It, it was too much information. It was all of it. It was the dog pile. And so I simply began to ask God, how do I get out of this? How do I get out of the craziness? How do I... I'm running so hard, doing really important things. You know, mm-hmm. it's 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 always important. Yes. But I said, Jesus, this can't be the life that you have for me. I just look at the fruit of it and I go, the fruit's not good. And so I just began to make some two degree shifts, I just began to make some changes that allowed me to be a human being again. Mm. And that's kind of the core of this, sort of like the assault on our humanity and just letting myself be human again. Yeah. And it worked. Like, yeah. it, it, it's working. It's working. And so I started sharing with my family, and then I started sharing with my friends. I'm like, you got to try this. And then it became apparent that, oh, this would be helpful, actually, to a lot of folks. I know that even as you say that, I'm, you know, reflecting on the things that leave me on any given day feeling shallow in the soul and empty and worn out and just exhausted. So what specific things you mentioned pace of life and technology, what are the things have you seen in your research of this in being a Christian counselor and dealing with men and women at these retreats? What are you seeing that is the root cause of all of this in current life as we know it? Well, I think the root cause is the collective momentum. It's the collective momentum of the world Mm -hmm. because technology was supposed to give us all this margin, right? And we were going to be able to garden again or, you know, take up an instrument or paint or whatever. But what happened is we are trying to keep up with the pace of technology. You open the door to the world and, you know, the email that comes in, the text, you know, the posts and the news and all of that. And we're Mm -hmm. trying to, we're trying to keep pace with it like responsible adults. Right. But the collective momentum of all of that, the complexity of people's lives, the amount of demands sucks us into a pace of life, a way of living that no one's enjoying. But it was actually Nicholas Carr's book, The Shallows, Mm -hmm. What the Internet's Doing to Our Brains, that got my attention. Just the title. I'm like, yep, that's it. I feel shallow. Mm. And what he reveals in that book, it's a pretty heavy read. He almost won the Pulitzer for it, but I can just summarize it for you. What he discovers through all his research is that our consumption of media, the way we consume information now, is literally fragmenting our attention our ability to give anything our attention. Mm. And so we lose focus very, very quickly Yes, and need to be therefore entertained by or interested by or have our focus captured by the next thing and then the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And what that does is it really unsettles the soul. Like your soul is never grounded. Your soul is never in a place of rest. It's just this constant, fragmented attention existence. And I'm like, that's it. That's me. I I totally fell into that. And it wears you out. It does. It does. It's interesting because when you think of the pace of life and the things that you were saying with, you know, all of this media and social media that fragments our attention, I often think of those rabbit holes that I get, you know, I will chase in two seconds. I think of them as affecting my time and sucking away my time. And I don't even recognize, I mean, I guess this is a fresh awareness for me that the damage it does not only to my time and my efficiency and my focus, but to my my soul. Yeah, exactly. There's a difference. Yep. Because you go read the older saints, you know, you're starting back like with the Desert Fathers, and, and they would say to you that our transformation, our becoming like Christ, our the healing of our humanity begins with being able to give God our attention. 
I was looking for God. I was praying. Yeah. I was doing the normal things. I was, I was reading scripture. You know, I was worshiping, but it wasn't working. And what I came to realize, as a therapist, I'm always fascinated to watch what's going on in my internal world because I know that that will help other people with their internal world. Yeah. Here's the revelation I came to: the soul is the vessel that God fills. The soul is the way that you receive God. Psalm 23, he restores my soul. God comes to us inside, Mm. primarily. You know, John 7, streams of living water are going to flow from your inmost being. But the revelation was this, was that if our soul is cooked, burnt, if our soul is as dry as a desert, you actually can't receive the grace that God is trying to give to you mm. because the instrument's broken. That that part of you that is meant to be filled with the presence of God is, is shriveled up like a raisin. Mm. And so if we would take care of our souls, if we would begin to just practice some kindness and do some some really simple things to care for our souls, then what happens is your soul begins to do better. You begin to open up. It's like a clenched fist. Your, your fist begins to open, your, and then your hands are open to receive God and yeah. all that he is bringing to you, the love or the beauty or the play or the laughter or you know all the things that enrich our lives in him and through him. So the soul is is the issue in the hour and yeah. and the the world that we live in right now is perfectly designed to absolutely bake your soul i mean just cook it and so you know that's when i began to like push back and say you can't do this to me anymore yeah, <laughs> like, no, yeah. you can't have my soul oh, i love it so let's talk some soul care then you give some really great simple practices in this book one we just talked about the 1 minute pause there are several others i'm going to list them, uh, list a few of them here and i'd love for you just to unpack that in in a way that that my graceology girls can actually like have a handlebar on this so Another one of the practices is benevolent detachment. Then practicing kindness, like you just mentioned, getting outside. Okay, that one changed me. You really challenged me on that too. And then stepping back from technology. So those are a few of the practices. What is benevolent detachment and why is it necessary? I think that caring people at this point don't realize that we actually have empathy overload. We are aware of way too much, mm. whether it's, you know, the fires in Australia or, or the latest shooting, the impeachment hearings, the da 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 you know, we yeah. just, we're aware of too much. And the human soul was actually never meant to carry all that. Now, you have these invitations in Scripture. You have like First Peter 5, where he says, cast all of your cares upon the Lord yeah. because he cares for you. And for years, I didn't understand that verse. It's lovely. I love the sound of it, but I couldn't do it. And it wasn't until I learned, Jesus began to say to me, John, just do this. Just give everyone and everything to me right now. Yeah. And I can use the pause to do that because I'm not asking myself to uh, do it for the rest of my life. I'm not even asking my soul to do it for a whole day. I'm just saying in this moment, I give everyone and everything to you. And this is actually how Jesus loves. You, you know, the extraordinary stories in the Gospels are the number of times Jesus walks away from human need. In, in the opening chapter of Mark, you know, the crowds are building and excitement's growing and yeah. the disciples wake up in the morning and the whole town is at the door, but they can't find Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so they go, it says he was off in a lonely place praying and they find him and they say, Lord, everyone's looking for you. Okay. Can we all just relate to that for a minute? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Everyone's looking for you, you know, and here's what Jesus says. He says, well, then let's leave. And you're like, what? What? (laughs) <laughs> How can that be love? How, wait. And the beautiful thing is, is that love is not constrained by the drama. Love love is free of the drama. Yeah. It, it just is able to operate really outside of it. So the way we get there 
is the pause. And the way we get there is to practice just giving it all over. I give everyone and everything to you, God. Yeah. Yeah. Bedtime is a really great time to do this, too, by the way, if you want to sleep. If you want to sleep well, you know. <laughs> totally. The situation you were just referring to in Mark chapter 6, at the very end, that you're saying Jesus is like, let's get out of here. It is. It, it, that's what he says. He says, come away with me to a quiet place where you can, where we can find some rest. It's a sacred invitation to rest. And that's exactly what you're saying is there is this opportunity that we have. It's really a momentary surrender in that giving back where we can experience room to breathe room yeah to breathe. yeah exactly and what augustine was explaining years ago was you have to empty yourself of everything that's currently cluttering your soul <laughs> if you want to be filled with god yeah like some something's got to go it's like a, it's like a crowded closet you know my I, our we have some dear friends and she's laid a law down to her husband she says if anything new comes in something goes out <laughs> so if you bring a jacket in a jacket goes out you know at, at some point you just can't keep adding right to the intake at some point you gotta let it all go so a couple times a day you just stop and you just say jesus I give it, I give it all to you. I give everyone and everything to you. And it's a very simple thing, but you're going to be delighted with the results. Yeah. So I 1000% agree. And I wonder what role, one of the things you talk about is beauty and, and the impact of beauty on our soul. What is the connection that you found between beauty and, and the outdoors and the healing of your soul? Because that actually surprised me. It's not that it surprised me. I just... It's, it wasn't a practice or a discipline that I considered something that would engage my soul in healing, but it was so, exactly. so amazing. Exactly, right? It's one of those things that's right there in front of us. God saturated the world with beauty, yeah. epic and intimate. You know, it's the frost on your windshield. It's the it's the you know rainy streets at night. It's candlelight. It's music. It's the way the sun comes through your kitchen window in the morning. Like it is all around us. Mm-hmm. Beauty is all around us. You don't have to go to Paris or, or Hawaii. You know, it's right here, because He knew beauty heals trauma. Beauty heals the human soul. Mm. And and there's some fabulous research on this, but basically it's because, well, okay, this is fascinating, Gwen. Why do we send flowers to people who are in the hospital? Why do we send flowers to, to someone who is grieving? Isn't that fascinating? It's like well, we now know. now that you bring it up, I'm, I'm like, oh my goodness. Wow. It, we know it intuitively yeah. that it brings it brings hope. Mm. It, it, it beauty speaks hope. It says everything's going to be okay. Beauty speaks of the goodness of God. Beauty speaks that evil doesn't get to win. Beauty is this wonderful reassurance of goodness all around us. And but here's the practice: is mm. most people will see it and they'll go, "Oh well, that's a really pretty sunrise," and then. Whoosh, they're just, you know, they're gone in the next moment. Here's what I'm suggesting is that you literally receive it. You receive it for the gift it is. I'll say, thank you for this beautiful moment. I receive it into my soul. Mm. I receive the beauty into my soul. And then you can let it do its healing work. So you just linger just a moment. And, you know, I'm not saying this is 15 minutes in front of a flower. It's just a moment where you go, that rose bush is extraordinary. You pause and you let it in, let it minister to your soul. Mm. And then once you start doing this, gang, like fill your life with beauty, like have music on in the house, get flowers in the kitchen, like hang artwork, do everything you can. Fill your world with beauty because it is so nourishing to the soul. Wow. This is awesome. This is so deep. And it's something that doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you've come from, what you've gone through. Every single one of us can have our eyes open to the beauty around us that God gifts us with moment by moment. And it can heal us. Exactly. It's coming to you all the time, gang. Yeah. 
Yeah. Another thing you talk about in the book and that I believe is a big part of your practice is meditation. Now, I read my Bible and all throughout the Psalms, the psalmist says, I meditate on your works. I consider your wonders, Lord. And it is clearly a biblical pretense. But there are some people who get weirded out by the word meditation and by the very thought of it. So how is this a part of your faith and why do you feel like it's important? Well, first, let's come back to the assault on your attention. So <laughs> yeah. uh, the all day long, your attention is being assaulted. It's the last piece of real estate that's up for grabs in the world, and everyone's trying to grab it. So it's not just your phone. It's the, you know, now it's digital billboards and it's push notifications, you know, and you, you go to the gas station and the, and the gas pumps have TVs now yes. and start playing <laughs> commercials at you. Crazy. It's like you can't you can't get away from it. It's yeah. just constant. It, even school, dig, the digital boards outside of schools now, right? They're mm-hmm. advertising this meeting and that thing and this, that, and that. Okay, so there's this assault on our attention. Back to the idea of the saints saying, well, if you want transformation, if you want wholeness, if you want restoration, you have to be able to give God your attention. So, so the idea of Psalm 1, that giving God your lingering attention, I can give you my attention, says that you will be like a tree planted by streams of living water and that you, your leaves won't wither you will be evergreen. And so the idea of like a meditative thing is simply to say, can you give anything at this time, anything, your lingering attention? Mm. You know, the beauty that we were just speaking of, you know, the songbirds that you're hearing out, out your window in the evening, can you just give that lingering attention? Because God will meet you there. Mm. But but especially the scriptures, especially being able to just linger, linger with a verse, linger with a paragraph and let it do its thing. Like, let it heal you. Yeah. That's that's the fight now. The fight is to get our attention back. Yeah. I love that. And that's, you know what, I believe that's a gift to my Graceology community. And I believe that everyone's taking a deep breath. And that's part of the pause app. The pause app is actually leads you in deep breath in, deep breath out. And and I feel like that's part of, you know, the gift of this conversation, John, and the gift of, of this book, Get Your Life Back, because sometimes we don't even realize that it's like, you know, it's it's being controlled by all of the things and all of the busy and activity in our lives. And so this is a, this is beautiful. So in these practices, I want to just what are a couple of the the really besides? OK, so take a walk, linger in the moment, listen, pay attention to the beauty. What are some other things that my Graceology girls can be doing today to impact not only their own souls, but their families and those in their workplace? Yeah, so. Obviously, the, in the technology world, just puts let's let's just get some simple practices going. So nobody gets to bring their phone to dinner. We're going to be human beings at dinner, yes. and nobody gets to take their phone into their bedroom. You know, if you've got teenage kids, it's like you can be on your phone, but you got to be out here in the living room. Mm. You know, so that you begin take back some human space in the house. Wow. Don't take your phone into your bedroom at night. Don't look at screens as the last thing you do because it it messes up your sleep. But especially, don't look at your phone first thing in the morning. Make a cup of coffee. Take 10 minutes. Look out the window. Say some prayers. Like you don't have to go straight to the phone. And if you'll model that for your kids, that that's just going to be huge if like hey we get to be human again we, you know we get to do real things and not get lost in the in the artificial world so that that would be a piece now here's a fun one Gwen, because most of your community are probably pretty good daydreamers i'm, get, <laughs> How I'm did guessing you know, John? that well i'm guessing that during the day yeah. you find yourself suddenly thinking about you know such and such going to aruba what <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so here's the thing one of the gifts that god has given us is the gift of memory mm. because beautiful moments pass too quickly 
they just fly by. And so even if you had a really rich Christmas this last year, or maybe you had your, you know, your fifth anniversary or, you know, birthdays, or it was that wonderful vacation you had two years ago where you did get to Aruba. The problem is it, it's gone. Yeah. It passes too quickly, but God gave us memory to go back. Use mm. your memory to go back to times that really nourished your soul, mm. like your favorite places. Oh, it's it's the you know it's the it's the shore, or it's my grandparents' cabin, or well, go back there. Yeah. Go back there in your memory for a few moments and and receive the gift again. Because there was so much gift in that moment and it all passed so quickly, you actually haven't mined it for all that it had to give you. Mm. So as we're having this chat right now, I'm looking on my computer screen and there's a huge picture of the Tetons. Mm. And the Tetons has a massive history in our family. We've taken the boys camping there ever since they were tiny. And and I can look at this picture and I'm there. Mm. And and I, I I hear the laughter. I remember the canoe trip. I remember swimming in the lake. And again, we're talking three minutes. This these aren't massive intrusions. These are little rescues in your day. Yeah that nourish the soul. I can just look at a picture or listen to a song, something to take me back into a moment. So daydream away, girls. I love it. And that wraps up part four of our Summer Rewind series with such good conversations. Be sure to visit both Holly and John online and connect with them on social media. As always, today's show is edited by Chad Shooping. Hey, if your church hosts women's events, or if you have questions, comments, or topic suggestions, I love hearing from you. Send me a message or a speaking inquiry right from my website at gwensmith.net. All of the links and the show notes from today's episode can be found at gwensmith.net slash graceology. That's gwensmith.net slash graceology. Hey, if you're one of my Graceology girls, be sure to join our Patreon community. When you do, you'll get exclusive content, early access, behind the scenes fun, and even some private hangouts with me. Learn more by visiting gwensmith.net slash give. That's gwensmith.net slash give. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'll be back soon with another episode. But until then, if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, please open up your podcast app and click that subscribe button. Subscriptions and reviews on Apple Podcast or whatever podcast app you listen on make a huge difference to those of us who are working hard to bring you these shows. And be sure to connect with me on social media as well. I'm at Gwen Smith Music on every social media platform, and I love hanging out on Instagram. And the show is at Graceology with an IE on every platform. Now get out there and have a beautiful, grace filled day. Mm-hmm.